And we are live. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to our eighth and final uh, session of Growing Pains of 2021. Wow. Uh, we're building a series of quick firesides with leaders all around Asia, sharing their stories, their learnings, and insights on developing some of their best people um, in their journeys as leaders. The goal of these sessions is to really give you bite-sized perspectives on how you can make impact in your team and your organization tomorrow. Today's guest, we have Mei Ching Kun. She's the Chief Marketing Officer of Squiz, a global and defines customer experiences for enterprises all around the world. May, I'm so thrilled to have you with us today. We're gonna to be discussing a very important topic, which is how can young leaders navigate negotiations in this complex environment? Thanks for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Will. May, I think we've had some pretty exciting news. Tell us a bit about, you know, some recent change in your professional journey. Uh, well, uh, uh, in the spirit of New Campus announcing <laughs> new roles, uh, I've just finished up three amazing years at SiteMinder, a, a travel tech company. Um, ended uh, the three years with our IPO, which was, you know, such a great journey to be on. Um, and now after a lovely four week break, I will be starting at Squiz uh, in the Chief Marketing Officer role. So I'm super excited. Um, it's just another global company based out of Australia, which is always, you know, fun. Um, and we're just going through a, a real transformational journey to hit our next level of growth and get to build up a team again and just uh, take the new product roadmap and, and just kind of spread the word about Squiz. May, one thing that I, I always... Uh enjoy about having conversations with you is that you're very reflective in your experiences and your journey um, with this big massive turnaround and you know obviously you, you've had a lot of um, exciting um, opportunities this year what were some of your personal reflection points as you turned the leaf into 2022? Um, I think it's uh, every opportunity that I've had uh, the privilege to, to you know to join the companies that I've been with they've all been on uh, they've never been in status quo kind of maintenance journeys. They've always been uh, new industries and always in stages of ambitious growth. And and this last, I would say last three years has been um, a huge learning experience in terms of humility for me. Um, when I entered into uh, the travel tech space, um, it was brand new industry um, right at the coal face of COVID. Um, when that happened and how it really hit the travel industry and just realizing um, how you really have to lean on others, particularly uh, not just your teams who, who you know, have gone through so much, right? They're looking to you for leadership when things are, you know, uh, unclear and when the outlook could be threatening, uh, particularly in the travel space. And, you know, what you do as a leader really counts there. Um, but it's also how you collaborate with other teams um, and, and how different parts of the world experience different things. Um, and it's really opened up, you know, my mind a lot more to how little I know, how little I need to, um, how much I need to rely on the people I work with uh, and how I need to change my mind often. Um, a lot of things changed really quickly for us and, and you go on decades of instinct and experience and you think you know it and then you realize actually no i don't other people know better or i'm learning something that's different so so that's been my experience it's been great i think one thing we we, we talked a lot about previously may is putting yourself in that position to be a leader um but also you know as a asian female leader um how do you open to more opportunities like that tell me a bit about your journey and your philosophy behind you know, sending the elevator down and how can, you know, next year uh, really, you know, allow you to propel more coaching and mentorship opportunities? How do you think about that? Um, you know, it is true. We have talked in the past about, you know, uh, if rising tides need to lift all boats and I've been really um, blessed to have the career I've had. Um, and and now, you know, it's, it's the opportunities with new campus to share, you know, what I've learned to more than just, you know, one-to-one -one kind of relationships of, of mentorships or, or chats that I've had. Um, and and uh, I think what it's taught me is um, there were, there, there are stereotypes of what an Asian um, 
professional or, or characteristic is like, you know, even more as an Asian woman uh, and then an Asian woman leader. I personally uh, was brought up with always thinking that, you know, I'm just as good as anybody else. Uh, I grew up in Malaysia. Um, I think my parents, um, you know, lived in the colonial times where you think, okay, you know, uh, the Western world knows best. Uh, and I think my my parents definitely ingrained it in me that, you know, trust in yourself, work hard, um, and you'll just be as good as anybody else. And I think those kinds of grounding and foundation helped me kind of just say, hey, if I prove myself, if I work harder than everybody else, um, and I stand up and, and have the confidence to know that I can achieve whatever I can to achieve, um, then you can actually make it no matter where you are, no matter what the color of your skin, no matter what gender you are. Um, but you need to also kind of do the work behind it. And that's, you know, the decades I've had to, to learn that, I hope to be able to share it now with a wider audience through New Campus and other things that I get involved with, yeah. So, a significant portion of our learners um, are women and 100% of them are people of color. Uh, and, you know, for a very long time, even now, it is looking towards European or Western practices when building the model organization, but that has definitely shifted in the past couple of years when you see new uh, success stories and new leaders emerge. Tell me a bit about, you know, some of the key lessons that you learned in terms of negotiating and putting your best foot forward. What has that, uh, what were some of your inflection points um, as you kind of evolved your career? It's an interesting one, um, you know, and, and I really, uh, to your point, I had to reflect on this a little bit to kind of structure my thoughts. I, I think, uh, you know, research shows that, you know, whether it's people of color, whether it's men, but in this case, men negotiate four times more often than women. Um, and women's expectations are generally 30% less than men in terms of the salary level uh, that they're expecting. Um, and, and this comes from a lot of socialization growing up right like you know we're thought we're taught to be agreeable you know relatives might joke about marrying rich to be secure um whereas you know for a for a the son it might be you know work hard and build up your wealth um you know it's about being polite it's about not causing ripples um and this starts from a very young age it could be in jest but it does actually stick around a little bit as you can see you know regardless of um maybe cultures um, but women are generally really strong negotiators at work because we're good at relationship building. We're good at, um, uh, you know, uh, collaboration, those types of things. We just have to look at negotiations as advocating for ourselves versus asking for something we believe we deserve, but somehow don't feel we have the right to demand. And, you know, I've thought about kind of some of the key steps to consider when we're looking at negotiating for ourselves, whether it's a pay rise or a promotion or a new job. You know, one, it's to do your homework and find out what you're actually worth in the market. Now, there are salary guides published by recruitment firms out there that are published every year that's publicly available, job posts online, glass doors. Um, you know, there's also kind of talking to peers in similar roles outside of your company. If you're if you have a do not discuss pay policy at work, which some countries do. Um, and often you'll probably be surprised at where you are pegged and what the general benchmark is for that salary for a similar role to yours in your market. And then the second thing I think is, you know, don't feel you have to tick every box before you put your hand up or ask for a promotion. Men have um, a tremendous confidence to go for something with a 50% fit. Um, women, on the other hand, you know, they might be a 90% fit for something, but they'll focus on the 10%. What else? You know, that's a gap. How do I close that? I'm not sure I'm ready for it yet. And, and I literally spoke to some really capable, high, you know, general manager type professionals in the last month who still thought that, um, which is quite amazing uh, in this day uh, and age. So, you know, figure out your strengths, gauge your ability to learn and master a new area versus knowing everything right away. You know, everything changes so much, particularly in, in technology, um, especially in the, the, the latest industries that we're in at the moment. So if you learn a new skill or an area before in the past, you can do it again. 
And it's more about having that confidence in your ability to learn rather than being a master already. And the third thing is don't stop asking. I think some of us think that if you don't get that pay rise or that promotion or that new job the first time, you have to stop asking. You know, uh, that once you tried it once, it didn't happen, it won't happen again. But you have to keep going. You know, ask for feedback as to why you didn't get it the first time and address anything around it and then come back to the discussion six months later. You know, if, if men are asking four times as often, they're getting a lot of practice and that's why they're really good at it, you know. And there's no professional penalty for asking. I think sometimes we have the idea, and this can be, uh, you know, equally men or women, if you get turned down the first time, uh, you worry about asking a second time or following up because you think that you'll be seen as being too demanding or disagreeable and somehow professionally you're going to be pegged down a notch. Um, but, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't if you do it professionally, if you do it with respect, if you've got your um, proof and, and your case to back it up, it just shows initiative and proactiveness. Um, so I think those are some of the things I've learned over the years about negotiating. Empowering, uh, empowering teams and organizations to think in this inclusive manner. I think for yourself and a lot of leaders, um, you might have had a few mentors um, throughout your journey. You might have had to figure out the hard way. But what is the responsibility of a new organization to have this as part of their culture, to have this open, transparent nature. What's your thinking around that as you're rebuilding and redesigning the new organization and new teams? Um, I think there's lots of stages to this, right? Like um, any leader or manager that's hiring people, it starts at the hiring stage and um, trying to be conscious about uh, skills, capability, but also diversity in approach and, and, and perspectives, um, not just in gender, but just in, in terms of the way you think and all things being equal between, you know, two candidates, you know, there's always an opportunity to, to look at, you know, um, balancing out the gender mix in, in the team, all things being equal. Like in marketing, for example, <laughs> trying to hire a guy is quite hard. Um, so, so I consciously do have to try to see if we can actually, all things being equal, the person being able to um, do the role and, and have technical skill sets to think, you know, proactively about getting more men in my team. Um, and, and so that's one thing you do as a manager starting at the hiring stage. And I think um, once you're in the company, um, you know, th there, there does have to be kind of a view on, you know, we talk about bringing the whole the whole person to work. Um, and uh, I think to successfully kind of build a team that's uh, gender, you know, diverse, perspectives diverse, um, I think you have to be aware of the unconscious biases that you do tend to have. And um, to your point, be transparent about that and, and be okay to talk about it openly. I think sometimes, um, we don't want to raise, you know, how are things at home or, or um, talk about anything personal uh, because sometimes it can be uncomfortable. Um, and, and I think sometimes people just need the, um, the door to crack a little bit open and then they can actually talk a little bit about what they may be going through themselves. And, and as a leader, you do need to almost start with that vulnerability. You may be you talking about something that you're going through or that you're not having a um, that you're struggling with something uh, and allowing them to kind of talk about it themselves. Um, and once you kind of open that kind of relationship and that culture in the business, it really allows um, you to get a better understanding of how do you actually help them um, with that challenge personally so that they can do a better job at work, they can thrive at work. Um, so I think um, some of the things that, you know, we should all be conscious of, I suppose, is um, no matter what culture you're in, I think, and this is changing, but no matter what culture you're in, uh, women do take the lion's share of home care. Um, you know, it could be your children, it could be the home. If you don't have kids, it could be elderly parents. Um, and 
And just that imbalance at home will impact their ability to, co to contribute and focus in the workplace. Particularly with COVID, we found that with remote working, there was just so much happening in your home life as well. Um, and, you know, the men in the relationship should just kind of be conscious of that and lean in a bit more. And this is happening so much more, but I think the more that happens, if you're a manager at work, uh, leaning in more at home, being more open about, you know, you doing the pickups or you doing, um, you know, the, the dinner cooking and not being able to kind of take that call or just kind of normalizing some of that discussion and, and um, conversation means that, you know, uh, it's okay for them to be open about that, but hopefully other other men take the lead uh, on being more supportive on the home front. And in the workplace, it's interesting as well because, you know, where there might be roles that are during a meeting or during a workshop or a brainstorm or a project where there might not be defined roles um, and, you know, you need somebody to take the notes or the minutes or to um, set the agenda or do the follow-up. Um, if there doesn't tend to be somebody who puts their hands up, Quite often, you'll find the, you know, there'll be a, a woman putting their hands up and saying, I'll, I'll just get it done. Um, and I think that the, the, the realization is that when that person has to do that in the meeting, uh, it takes away from their ability to contribute in that meeting, to, to be part of the discussion fully, to um, add their perspective and, and be seen to contribute as well. So I think those type of conscious things we have to think about, it's not about, um, anyone giving the hand out or a leg up to anybody else, but it's kind of everybody leaning in and, and taking an equal part in what they, what you do in the workplace or at home. How have you, uh, you mentioned a lot of really interesting points, May, um, and, and I'd love to kind of dive deeper into how you've been able to find balance, uh, both at home and in business. Uh, you know, what were some of your key challenges and you know, key uh, positive inflection points? And, you know, are you still trying to find that balance now? Um, I think this is an interesting conversation because I think sometimes women, particularly um, this generation, you know, we're so empowered. Um, you know, the saying that you can have it all uh, is part of that discussion. And, and I think it's okay not to want it all, all the time, right? Like I've been through my life where you know, I had my first baby, you know, I took a year off. Um, now, over that time, I did start a business as well, because I did need that stimulation. So I wouldn't advise that to everybody. But um, I went back part time after that. Uh, and, and that was okay. It wasn't a, you know, I wasn't gunning for a, a, a leadership role. I just wanted to keep my foot in the door to make sure that I stayed current. And then when my kids were older, that's when I decided to put the pedal on the metal again. Um, and, and your life will kind of go through those ebbs and flows. And I think for me, it was just about keeping my foot in the door and remaining current and keeping myself um, engaged and occupied in the industry. Um, but how ambitious I wanted to be depended on what I was able to do with my family and what stage they were in. Um, and I think that's okay. Um, and I think in between that, you know, when I when I I have been a working mom pretty much my entire family life, some days you are just a better mother, and you're a crap employee, and some days you're a sterling professional, and you really suck at home. Um, and it's okay. It's okay. The kids forgive you. The manager forgives you. Eventually, it all balances out in the end. So I think we just need to be easier on ourselves a bit. And, and I love having that real type of conversation, May, because for most young professionals or mid-career professionals, sometimes they may feel stuck and almost a bit awkward to ask these open and transparent questions. Um, when you think about designing the next version of your team as you uh, start to move into a leadership role with Squiz, what does that look like next year? You talked a bit about finding that balance, helping people you know, obviously succeed in their own pathways, but also at times acknowledging that it's okay that you're not, um, you know, striving to be the top. What does your philosophy and thesis look like in 2022, having learned all of this and with COVID still up in there? 
Um, I think uh, I've got some interesting challenges, obviously. So, you know, our, our teams are almost fully remote. Uh, in, in many cases, my team, uh, at the existing team at the moment, some are in New Zealand, all the way down to, you know, uh, Georgia in, in the States. So time zones are interesting. Um, I obviously have been speaking to each of them already, um, just thinking about, you know, what is the total mix of the team? You know, everybody has a role, but people have passions. Um, and they've got um, stronger skill sets. So I've been trying to put together a, a jigsaw puzzle of the technical skills, but also the passion that they have so that we, we are actually quite a diverse sum of our parts. Um, and some of the things I'm consciously thinking about is also um, what does the team not just look like now, but where can they go? What does the team look like in 12 months, in 24 months? So I actually did that exercise. It was, it was very mind numbing to try to do that because you have to work out different scenarios. But, you know, the lessons I've learned from the past is the, the person that you hire now in the role that you have now, particularly in growth companies, it changes quite quickly, six to 12 months later, um, if you're growing the way you should be. And what I, what I want to avoid is um, having them feeling stuck. Like they, they don't think that they can succeed in the second iteration of the, the company or the structure um, or the, the roles that we've created don't fit where they want to go next. So I'm trying to kind of head that off at the past and start thinking about that now, even before I've joined um, so that people do have different pathways that they can take. If they want to kind of, to your point right earlier, um, stay in a technical role and not advance into a leadership role. What are the avenues for you to go laterally or to expand your scope? But if you want to be a leader, what would be the next iteration of that? You know, so just starting to think about that. I love that we're not only discussing as an individual how he or she can think about negotiating their path, but also your responsibility and our responsibilities as leaders to meet them in the middle, uh, but also support them in their journey. May, last question from my side, as we steer towards the end of 2021, what are some final things that you're thinking about that you haven't checked off? Uh, I know you have, you know, a long three to four weeks to reset, reflect. What are you thinking about? What are you, um, you know, what are some outstanding uh, things on your 2021 bucket list? Gosh, um, is this personal or career wise? <laughs> I think they marry up nowadays. <laughs> Um, I think first of all, uh, you know, it's really getting myself in uh, a headspace that I am just refreshed again so that I can be ready to charge off in 2022 and, and be a leader from the get-go that, you know, the team and the business need. So I think, you know, to your point about personal and career lives matching, that's really important. And I think um, it's been a really hard run the last two years, really hard run. And we've run at a really fast pace in my last role. Um, and uh, I think even when I just finished up last Friday, I physically actually became really exhausted on Saturday. I didn't even realize it. So I think just taking care of my health um, mentally and physically is going to be a really important one. Um, and then just, um, I think just being able to do research again in my, my free time, just doing research on the industry, looking at what's next, um, you know, reading up on you know, what's going on in different industries from a people side of things, culture, um, tech, you know, tools, just using that time to do all that kind of absorption that you just don't have time to do when you're actually in the, in the throes of work. So, and then finally, it's just spending time with my kids and my husband, you know, go away on a holiday somewhere uh, without a lockdown. So that's really, a, those are really priorities for me. I love that. And I think at the end of the day, uh, for those listening, it is about finding the balance and knowing when to pedal to the metal, but also take that reset period when needed. Uh, May, thank you so much for your time today. And for everyone on today's session, uh, thanks for connecting and hearing the stories from May and her journey as a leader. Uh, if you want to get in touch, you can find us on LinkedIn or you can reach out to our email, hello at newcampus.co. May, thanks again for your time. I will look forward to working with you closely early next year, you take care of yourself and we'll see you on the other side. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Meg.